Now, back in the day, men were real men. Women were real women. Small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri were real small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri. Linux was real Linux. Windows was real Windows. And never did the two have anything to do with each other <laughs> until Windows subsystem for Linux. Hello there. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. Thanks to Douglas Adams for that opening quote there. So today I want to talk about Windows subsystem for Linux. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. So Windows subsystem for Linux is an official thing, official feature of Windows provided by Microsoft itself that provides a compatibility environment that allows Linux tools and programs to run inside of Windows. And once you install it, you get access to a terminal window where you can run bash and from there you can run all of the normal things. You would run compilers and you can do editing, copy things around, secure shell and access uh, a virtualized, a containerized, compatible kind of Linux uh, environment. Now, I don't want to get at all into the politics. You might think this is a terrible idea or you might think it's a great idea. I want to look at the technology that Microsoft provide. Now, as I said, this is mainly for command line tools. Now, I'll talk at the end about uh, GUI apps. So let's just pick that up at the end. But before we do that, let's just jump straight in and install it and see what it provides. Okay, so here we are on a Windows 10 machine. And the first thing you should do is go down to the start bar and find the control panel. I'll do that by starting to type the word control. There comes the control panel. Then go to here to programs and then turn all Windows features on or off. That will bring up a little list of things that are activated here on this Windows feature that are installed. And we want to find it here, Windows subsystem for Linux. And we want to tick that and click OK, and that will start to install it. And then once the installation has completed, it says we need to reboot the PC, so we'll just quickly reboot this. Okay, and once the PC has restarted, we now need to install a Linux distribution. And the way you do that is you go to the Microsoft Store, and then you can pick a Linux distribution that you want to run. Now, I'm gonna opt for uh, Ubuntu. I think if we type in here Linux, we can see some of the different versions that are available here. Here we go, look at this, Debian and Kali uh, and SUSE uh, Enterprise and so on. So I'm gonna go with the uh, Ubuntu 18.04 long-term support version. So that will be uh, handy because we know it's supported for a long time, five years from 2018. So just click install on that. Microsoft asked me if I want to sign in with my account. I do not at this point. And so it's going to start downloading that now. And then that will install in a moment. Okay, now that's installed, we can launch. I'm not going to launch it from here because I want to show you how you launch it from the start menu. You can go down here and it is up there, of course, or we can start typing uh, and it finds it like that. So let's launch it and up will come a window. And this window says there's a little bit more of installation that requires to happen just before uh, it can actually work fully. This only happens one time, the very first time you install it. So we'll let it finish doing its work there. Okay, and one of the things it needs to do is to create a, an account for us. So I'm gonna type in a username and password here for myself. Okay, and that's it. Now here we are on a uh, Linux command shell, actually in Bash, I think. So you can do normal things, you know, LS, there's no files in there to show. We can run top, for example, to see uh, the processes that are running. Now, most things, um, you know, PWD shows us where we are. Now, most uh, things that you might need are probably not installed in this. It's a quite a minimal system. So even a C compiler, GCC, uh, is not there. It will say it won't be able to find that. Uh, you know, things like even like Python are not even uh, installed. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna install uh, the command line uh, GCC compiler, C compiler, and we're gonna write a quick C program and run it. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna see how compatible that binary is with other Linux systems. So first of all, we do a, um, a sudo uh, apt get uh, update to make sure all of the uh, links to the repositories are up to date. We'll just let that run for a moment. Okay, and then we're gonna run uh, apt get install GCC. So we'll just let that run. Yes, we'd like to install it all please. And this will take a few minutes to just download that stuff. Okay. 
Okay, so that's now installed. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write a very simple C program, hello world.c. So let's just quickly type that in. Hello world from Windows subsystem for Linux. Okay, let's uh, say about that. Let's see if it compiles. GCC, hello world.c. Yes, it does. So now we have a file called a.out, which as we can see is a 64-bit Linux file. Okay, and we can now just run that, a.out, and there we go, hello world from WSL. Now, I have another server on my network, which uh, is a Linux, a standard Linux server, nothing funny about it at all. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to copy this file, a.out, uh, to that server. Okay, and it's on a local address here, okay. And we're just gonna copy straight into my home directory there. It's gonna ask us if that's okay. Yes, type in the password for that other server. Okay, so it's now copied a dot out over to there. So now if we actually log in to there, using secure shell, and type in the password for there. Now on this system, which as you can see is a Ubuntu 16.04 system, we can see there is now this file called a.out and it's exactly the same file and we can run it here. There we go, a.out. So I've taken this Linux file that I've compiled on the Windows subsystem for Linux and I've copied it over to a normal Linux server and it's run fine. In fact, if we uh, go back to our normal server, I have my thread test tool, if you remember from other videos. And what we can actually do is we can copy the source code for that. Uh, one, it's also on that server, 1681.7 source slash thread test tool.c and let's copy it over to here. Okay, and here is that C program that I've got there, okay? And the reason I'm copying this over is because this is a bit more of a complicated program because for example, it's running uh, with pthreads. So let's do that, gcc minus pthread minus o thread test tool, thread test tool dot c. And there it has its compiled fine and then we can actually run it and here we can see it running on my uh, on this uh, Windows uh, subsystem for Linux. So that's worked absolutely fine. Now, of course, you can do other things. For example, if you want to get access to your files on Windows, okay, let's uh, go over to here like this. If we go to, if we do a DF minus H, we can see that the C drive there is mounted on slash mount slash C. So we can go to slash mount slash C. Okay, and that is my actually my Windows files. And if I go to users uh, Gary, okay, now that is my uh, normal uh, directory. And in here we could create ourselves a, you know, an, a directory called Ubuntu. And we can go in here and let's say we can copy actually uh, that C program that I just wrote, hello world. Um, so we're gonna copy hello w.c to here and we can copy a.out to here. And there they are in that directory. You can still run a.out, it's fine. I can go to Windows Explorer, and in here, if I uh, want to drill down through to my normal directory, um, the C drive, users, uh, Gary, and then now here I've got this uh, Ubuntu folder. So I'm very easily able to access files between the two different systems. In fact, if I was running, for example, a nice IDE like uh, Visual Code, I could actually run this here and edit the programs and then switch to this window here to compile or make the program. So there you have it. So basically, uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux gives you a bash command line that allows you to run Linux. Now, just for example, if you went to some etc here, it really does think it's a uh, Linux system. If we look at LSB release, it thinks it's a Ubuntu 18.4. You can run commands like uh, PSAUX, but if you notice, it's more kind of like a, a container.
than a full system because there's only a few uh, commands running here. One other interesting thing though is if we start up another one, you can open multiple windows and it doesn't start another Linux system, it's the same one. So if we run uh, uh, top in this one to see the difference, you can actually see there are two bashes running in here now and there's H top and there's top. So one's running in here and one's running in here. So you, multiple windows give you access to the same subsystem. It doesn't give you multiple copies of Linux running. You're all able to access the same things. And in this here, we can see exactly the same programs uh, and A dot out and all that that was there. So you get a kind of window terminal onto that one subsystem. Okay, let me show you now what happens if we install to Linux distribution. So let's start to exit out of these things here. So we go back to the Microsoft Store. And again, now we're going to look for a Linux. Okay. And uh, actually, there's another thing here that shows you all the ones that are available, uh, just the official ones are available. So I'm going to go for Debian this time. So we've already installed uh, Ubuntu. Let's now go for Debian and let's install it and see what happens again. Windows asking me if I want to use my username and password. I don't at this moment. So let that download and then we'll see what happens. Okay, so that's installed. So let's go down here to the start menu again. And now we can see Debian. And when we click on that, up comes a window. And just like when we installed Ubuntu, there is a final few minutes of uh, installation that needs to happen. So we'll just let that finish. And as before, we need to type in a username and password. So we'll just type those in now. And there we go. Now we have a bash shell here for uh, uh, Debian. Now, here's the important thing. If I do ls now, if I list the files, am I going to see those files that we were using in uh, Ubuntu? You know, the C files and the files we compiled. And the answer is... No. So when you install a second distro, it's like having a second uh, virtual Linux environment, okay, like a separate uh, container. So here we can see it's a very simple Linux system running under that uh, Windows uh, subsystem, okay, and the files are not there, which means that if we go down here and run uh, Ubuntu, Okay, so we can have two of these open now. And here, if we do an LS, we can see those files. So I've got two separate uh, environments. Now I can still go to, if we do a DF minus H, I can still go to the C drive. So if I go to mount C and then users, Gary, and then we create a directory there, if you remember, called Ubuntu. And there we have those two files that we ran. And in fact, we can still run A dot out and there it is running, but this is a different environment. So another advantage of this is we can actually install two or three or more different uh, Linux subsystems here and have all of them uh, running. Now, if you actually uh, look here, if you ask it to uh, tell you about the etc slash OS release, it says it's running uh, Debian. Here, if we do slash etc slash uh, OS release, it's saying I'm running Ubuntu. So there we have two complete differences. And here, remember here we have installed um, GCC and it, it says there's no file. If I type GCC here, it says not found. So I have to go and do the app install. So completely two uh, separate environments, which is a really, really cool way of being able to do testing and uh, developing across uh, two Linux uh, environments, all with inside uh, the Windows subsystem here. Okay, so I said I would mention GUI apps. So as you saw, this is primarily a way of running command line tools. Now there is a way of running uh, GUI apps. And you, to do that, you need an X server actually running on your Windows desktop. Now, if you'll be interested in the video about how to get an X server running and how to connect to, let's say, a Raspberry Pi and have it bring back the interface onto your Windows PC and the same with Windows uh, subsystem for Linux, then let me know in the comments below and I'll make a video about that. Also, there is now a second version of Windows Subsystem for Linux, really cleverly named WSL2 because it's the second version, and that actually provides a much more virtualized environment, including an actual bona fide Linux kernel. Now, at the moment, you can find that uh, in the insider versions of Windows at the time I'm making this video, but we're, it's available if you're a subscribed to that program where we can actually have a look at what that's going to do. So again, if you'd like a video about WSL2, please let me know in the comments below and I'll go ahead and make that. Other than that, my name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explained. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please do give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget the new Speedtest G channel. And uh, well, I suppose that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri were small. Insider. Ah. Oh. Ah. Oh.